an assessment, but rather how right was Landau, like a sort of shocked appreciation. Um, yeah, so I tried to put the yeah, bold there. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna start with a sort of yeah, ma manifesto for this program and um, intersperse in, in that discussion uh, some, some what, what I think are, are some, some new observations. And then this will lead to a sort of uh, extended application of this point of view, um, which, which is at least conjecturally actually holographic. Um, okay, so, so uh, um, you might say, well, why, why do we need a campaign to rehabilitate the reputation of, of Landau? Um, and I guess we really don't, but um, what, I, what I mean by that is, uh, is the following. So um, the, a, a way of thinking about phases of matter and transitions be, be, between them is, uh, is by thinking about how they represent their symmetries. So this is, this is a uh, paradigm initiated by, by Lano. And, and I guess the more, a more precise way to say that is um, uh, phases of matter should be classified by, by what symmetries they break. And uh, you know, one way to think, one way, one consequence of this is is uh, that gapless excitations in a phase or degeneracy, ground state degeneracy in a phase, should should arise as Goldstone modes for spontaneously broken symmetries, uh, continuous or discrete, respectively. And uh, um, combined with with Wilson's insights, this this leads to a sort of uh, leads to the idea that gaplessness or degeneracy is something that needs to be explained. That there you know there should be if, if there's a, a gapless phase of sort of a, a, a stable uh, situation with, with gaplessness or degeneracy, then, then that should have an explanation uh, in particular along these lines. Um, and uh, well, there are, some, there are some apparent exceptions to this, to this point of view on, on phases of matter. Um, and and I, I guess the reason, the reason I say that it's a campaign to rehabilitate the reputation of Landau is that if you've been to any condensed matter talk, quantum condensed matter talk in the last, I don't know, however many years, um, you know, many of them begin by saying, well, Landau has told us that we should classify phases by symmetry, but, but uh, uh, I'm here to tell you that he was, he was wrong. And, you know, here's an example of a phase or a critical, critical theory that's uh, beyond Landau in some sense. And usually beyond Landau means something involving topology. So some examples of, of phases of matter, which, which are beyond Landau in, in the sense is uh, topological order. Um, so um, for example, the deconfined phase of Z2 lattice gauge theory, uh, realized for example in the, in the TORC, in an exactly solvable model in the TORC code depicted here, uh, or fractional quantum Hall states, which are you know, actually, actually really exist in experiments. Um, and, uh, even even more familiar things like like the Coulomb phase of electricity of, of E and M is uh, is you know a deconfined phase of the gauge theory which um, uh, how to say is difficult to think about uh, as a consequence of symmetries at least had been um, and then there's some more examples in red here which I actually don't know how to explain in this way and so I'm not going to say anything else about them and this is how to say this is um, for, um, how to say, fodder for the continuation of the program in the future. Um, so, uh, but these, these two examples, actually it turns out we can understand completely within uh, Landau's paradigm. And the, the, the basic reason for this is that um, we need to expand what we, what we mean by symmetries. And so uh, the thing that we, we uh, Landau called a symmetry is what we should call, actually call a zero form symmetry where, um, the, the, the conserved current in the case of a continuous symmetry is, is a one form. And uh, the fact that it's divergence free means that there's a charge, which is conserved, meaning that it's independent of what time slice you integrated over. And I think it's, it's a useful observation, uh, how to say, uh, even here to notice that this is really a topological condition. It says that this, this quantity Q depends only on the topological class of this uh, co-dimension one surface over which we integrate the, the charge density. And uh, perhaps with that insight, one is led to, to generalize this idea to a, a current that has two indices, that is, is, a, is a two form, two anti-symmetric indices. And uh, its conservation, that is its divergence freeness in this sense, means that uh, there's a thing, star j, that we can integrate over a co-dimension two slice of space-time. 
and uh, its diversion sprinkness means that it, it only depends on the topological class of that of that codimension two object. So again, uh, a topological condition. And in the case of ordinary symmetries, the objects that are charged into the symmetry are local operators. That's this kind of uh, this kind of statement. In the case of one form symmetries, the charge objects are instead loop operators. So the variation of a loop operator under this one form symmetry generated by J here, Q is this charge, is, um, is uh, again, it's linear in this uh, uh, charged operator. And uh, it's, its transformation only happens if it links with the, with the curve, with, if the surface sigma links with the curve C. Go away, Dropbox. OK. Um, and a good example of this phenomenon is an ordinary Maxwell theory. Uh, if in ordinary Maxwell theory, there is no charged matter, then uh, F satisfies this condition. This is, this is just Maxwell's equations without any charged matter. The charged objects are Wilson loops. And um, even if there is charged matter, there's a one form symmetry in Maxwell theory, which is whose current is, is star F and the charged objects. So the, this is conserved by the Bianchi identity that is the absence of magnetic monopoles. And the charged objects are the Otof loops, that is the Wilson lines of the dual gauge field. And uh, we can also define finite transformations in each of these cases. So here, you know, in the ordinary one-form case, you just exponentiate the charge. Uh, similar, we can do the same thing in the, in the one-form case. Um, and the, the poetical description of what it means to have a, a, conser a, a conserved zero-form charge if the charge is carried by particles is that their world lines can't end. The only way they can end is by being created and annihilated by charged operators. And in the one-form case, that, that's the statement that there are some string world sheets that can't end, except again on charged operators, which create those closed strings. Um, and in both cases, there's a, there, we can have a discrete version where in fact there's no current, but there's still a charge. Um, the consequence of that is that the particles can disappear in groups of K. And in the, in the one-form case, it's the, it says that the strings can disappear or end in groups of K. Okay, so by the way, I hope, I hope you'll, you won't feel timid about asking questions. I'm not gonna see if you raise your hand, so just please just un, unmute yourself and ask. Um, okay, and so how does this lead to classifications of phases of matter? Well, just as in the zero form case, the symmetry can be unbroken or broken, and it'll be useful to remind ourselves or to, you know, to describe in a certain way what it means to, to not break or break a zero form symmetry. So in the unbroken phase, um, the, the signature of this is that correlations of charge operators are short ranged and decay when, when the as the charge object grows. So what I mean by a charged object in the case of a zero form symmetry is a zero sphere. A zero sphere is two points, right? X squared equals one. Um, and, uh, um, and so the charge object is just, uh, just this two point, two point function. And by the size of the charge object, I just mean it's the separation between the two, the two charge insertions. And uh, in the case of a one-form symmetry, we, in this language, it's exactly the same. Uh, the symmetry is unbroken when, when correlations of charge operators are short-ranged. In decay, when the charge object grows, the charge object is now a loop operator. And this is the statement that it satisfies an area law. So uh, in, in the case of ordinary ENM, the area law phase for, uh, for this electric, electric loop is, uh, is the superconducting phase, where the photon is gapped. And okay, so the broken phase for a zero form symmetry says that the, the, the two point function, the, the, let's say the one point function of this S zero sphere excitation doesn't fall off as we make the zero sphere large. That is, there's a piece which is independent of the separation. And in the one form case, that's the statement that the Wilson loop satisfies a perimeter law. And this is the same as not falling off as the loop grows because we can, we can add counter terms which are local along the curve and to remove this uh, dependence on the perimeter, that is just an integral along the curve, we can redefine the operator by such a factor. And so it's, this is the statement that the large loop has a vacuum expectation on. And uh, okay, so, so some consequences of what does it mean to spontaneously break a higher form symmetry? In the case of a discrete higher form symmetry, I claim that this is really, really basically by definition what it means to have topological order. I didn't define it earlier. What I mean by topological order is degenerate ground states which are locally indistinguishable. Locally indistinguishable means that no local operator um, mixes those ground states. In order to get from one topologically degenerate ground state to another one, you have to act with some, some non-local extended operator, exactly the kind of operators that, that um, generate a one-form symmetry group or a, a p-form symmetry group with p bigger than zero. 
Um, and the, the statement that that symmetry group is spontaneously broken is exactly the statement that that algebra of, of, of loop operators is uh, acts on the, on the ground state in a way that doesn't give back the ground state. It says that you know, the ground state is taken by these by the, the symmetry generators to another ground state. Um, so that's that's exactly what we mean by topological order. And some so two examples of this. Maybe the slide is a little too busy, but but uh, let me let me just uh, uh, highlight what I'm trying to say here. So one example is is uh, ZN gauge theory the, or the Torah code. Um, a description in this language of, of that is is in D space time dimensions is to say that it has a, a ZK one form symmetry and a ZK D minus two form symmetry, which are which are um, represented by unitary operators. This is the one form symmetry. It, that is, it's a, given a curve, we get an element of the group, which is just ZK. And here, given this, this represents the D minus two form symmetry, given a D minus two manifold in the space time, we get an element of ZK. And um, if these guys satisfy this algebra, U times N is a root of unity, uh, sorry, U times V is a root of unity times V, time, v times U. Uh, if, and the root of unity is, is not one, if, those, if the curve and the D minus two manifold intersect, um, rather if, if they're linked is what I mean by that number, um, then, then uh, this is exactly the, the algebra of electric uh, uh, flux and magnetic flux surfaces in, in ZK gauge theory. And maybe a more familiar realization of this is in terms of BF theory, where the action for a dynamical D minus two form and a dynamical gauge field is, uh, is this generalization of the Chern Simons action. And U and V are realized as these, the Wilson loop and this generalized surface operator for those two things. John, a quick question, just to keep it light. Yeah. But you know, I am in uh, training on this metaphysicist, and I learned a long time ago that to, to figure out the logical order of this kind, right? You have to throw loops around Tory, et cetera. So in this regard, I don't think it's new, right? It's something that is similar. Sure. Except that on this metaphysicists have a big trouble understanding two forms and higher forms. You don't learn it. I learned it via string theory and even applied it to, in a different context. I, I agree. I, I think many, many people have appreciated this fact. Yeah, I guess that actually, this is the fact I think that was first pointed out by Nusinov and Artis sometime in the. In the yeah. Uh, uh, so Nusinov is my former postdoc, and it was kind of surprising, but on a more general level, right? It, it's a complete standard thing, right? To show loops around Tori to figure out whether you have topological order or not, right? It's, it's sort, sort of. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. The real canon of conventional topological order systems uh, of the deconfining kind, blah, blah. Well, I think I, I think the the thing I want to emphasize. I, I agree. So so far, what I'm saying is not. Uh, I'm, I don't want to take credit for this observation. Yeah, exactly, I, right? but, uh, I, I still but, understand. but I want to emphasize that it can be understood from the point of view of symmetries. That's yeah. the. That's, yeah. 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 Board, I appreciate that. I learned them. I know where you're going. Good. That's okay. The problem is called as metaphysics, right? Because they have no clue what you mean as a two for it. Uh, ma many of many of them have learned by now. <laughs> by now, <laughs> yeah. perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps because of you guys, I guess. I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so okay. So another another example that Jan will, will surely agree with is is that we can understand um, fractional quantum Hall states, abelian fractional quantum Hall states, for example, in this language as saying that there is a, a zk one form symmetry, and this is in d, d equals two plus one, where the the generators actually have a have a slightly twisted algebra, which you could think of as a consequence of the Tuft, the Tuft anomaly, which is the statement that the flux carries charge. And this algebra realized, you know, the, the smallest representation of this algebra is uh, is k-dimensional, and those are the k ground states of the, say, the Laughlin Laughlin state on a on a torus. Um, it's I think actually it's it's not entirely clear whether we can understand the most general topologically order state in 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 this in this language. Um, I don't want yeah I don't want to get into that in any detail, but uh, at least it's it's certainly a useful language for understanding many 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 examples. Okay, so um, uh, perhaps a more ambitious application of this point of view is to think about the case where the U1, the U1 one form, the one, sorry, the one form symmetry is continuous. So, and the claim is that the gaplessness of the photon, even in the real world, can be understood as can be understood as required by by the spontaneous breaking of this of a, a U1 one form symmetry. And uh, so, exactly that that uh, uh, the one that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so one way to think of, one way to understand this is by analogy with the case of spontaneously breaking the U1 zero form symmetry. So one way to diagnose that 
is to couple it to a background gauge field. And you know, if I spon spontaneously break the symmetry that the background gauge field is coupled to, then I'll, I'll generate a mass term for that gauge field, or I guess this is the Anderson-Higgs mechanism. So I'll generate a term in the action which, which goes like a squared. But then if I demand gauge invariance, in order to make that gauge invariance, it requires that there's some mode that transforms nonlinearly to make this whole thing gauge invariant, uh, such that the whole thing transforms, so that you know, the, the Goldstone mode and A transform like this, this whole thing is invariant. And this is a global symmetry in the case when this, this parameter is closed and um, voila, the Goldstone boson. Um, in the case of, of a one-form symmetry, if, was, if we, we would couple it to a two-form background gauge field, and again, the sort of uh, two-form generalization of the, of the Meissner effect would say that there has to be a B squared term in the action, and making that gauge invariant requires that we add to it some, some kind of one-form field, um, which, which now you see if I set B to zero, this is exactly the Maxwell action. And uh, the role of the, the Maxwell coupling is played by this sort of stiffness of that uh, uh, spontaneous breaking. Okay, so, so uh, um, here, here's a question that you might have upon hearing, hearing this, this explanation of why the photon is massless. Um, which is in, in particle physics, we're, we're used to the idea that when you have an emergent symmetry, which in part, particle physics is called that accidental, um, uh, that means it's, it's a symmetry which it's not a symmetry because it's, ex, it's explicitly broken by some irrelevant operator. So that is the action is some symmetric action plus, plus a term which involves a charged operator. Um, and that charged operator has some dimension, some, some mass dimension, I've put, I've put something in here to restore the dimensions. Um, and, uh, Okay, so that so there can be approximate symmetries, and approximate symmetries can also be spontaneously broken. And when they do, when they're they are spontaneously broken, they lead to not Goldstone bosons, but pseudo Goldstone bosons, where the mass of the of the would be Goldstone boson isn't zero, but rather is it is proportional to this this coupling that we added, uh, which breaks the symmetry. And it's only massless in the limit when we take the scale at which the symmetry is broken all the way off to infinity. And so you might you might wonder, based on this point of view. Um, does the, you know, uh, I said that, that this electric one form symmetry is a symmetry in the absence of magnetic monopoles. And so would it, does it mean that if there is, if somebody does find a magnetic monopole, or even if they don't find it, if they do exist with some very large mass, um, does that mean, since, since I'm claiming that the photon is a Goldstone boson for the symmetry, does that mean that the photon actually has a small mass, which is a consequence of this mass of the monopole? And uh, the answer seems to be no. Uh, a cheap explanation for that no is by dimensional analysis. So if we ignore the mass of the electron, for example, take the mass of the electron to be infinity, I think zero would also work. Then the only scale in the problem is the mass of the monopole. But we need that the mass of the photon goes to zero when the mass of the monopole goes to infinity. And so the mass of the monopole can't appear in the numerator of the photon mass. And then there's no other mass to make up the dimensions. And so what? So it has to be zero. Um, so this answer is a little bit cheap. Uh, maybe we need a better answer. Um, a slightly better answer is the claim that, you know, so, so here, in order to break the symmetry, we had to add to the action charged operators. But the operators that are charged under a one-form symmetry are loop operators. They're not local operators at all, and we can't add non-local operators to the action, the end. Um, that's also not entirely satisfying. I think it's, I think, well, okay. It's sometimes, it's at least sometimes correct, but it's, yeah. We can do a little bit better. So to, to do a little bit better, let's think about, first let's think about the discrete analog. So in the case of, say, the toric code, this, this uh, solvable limit of Z2 gauge theory, um, the dis discrete one-form symmetries are exact symmetries. You can write down the operators and generate them. They commute with the Hamiltonian. But anywhere else in this deconfined phase, this broken phase of the, of the Z2 one-form symmetry, they're emergent symmetries. They're, they're explicitly broken by the lattice. Um, that is, there's, yeah, there's, there's matter that allows the loops to break, um, but they're still spontaneously broken. And uh, the fact that they're spontaneously broken means that they, they take, in the thermodynamic limit, they take ground states to other ground states. The, tor the, the topological order is uh, exactly there, despite the fact that the, sym the symmetry is only approximate microscopically. And there's actually a rigorous proof of this in the discrete case using quasi-adiabatic continuation. Um, okay, so then emboldened by this, let's return to the continuous case. And something we can do to remove the distinction between zero-form symmetries and one-form symmetries is, is compacted by the theory on the circle. 
So that is, you know, identify one of the dimensions of space periodically, x is equivalent to x plus 2 pi i, 2 pi r. Um, and in that case, we can, we can you know, think about the, the limit where the circle is small, and we can uh, decompose the 3 plus 1 dimensional gauge field into, uh, into its parts. There's a 2 plus 1 dimensional gauge field, little a, which we can dualize in three dimensions to a, to a scalar, a pseudo scalar, I guess. And, uh, and there's also a scalar that comes from the holonomy of the, of the gauge field around the compact direction. And so if, if we add, so if we include electrically charged particles with some mass and E in this theory, then they can, their world lines can, can wind around the circle and they'll generate terms in the effective action that look like this, All right? So this, you know, think of, the, think of them as instantons with instanton action Me times R plus this phase, plus the, you know, the phase associated with their propagation through this, this vector, background vector field. And uh, this quantity is, so integral of A is what I call phi. So this, this, is a math, this is a cosine phi term, which if I expand this around small phi as a mass, it says that the phi, the, this phi excitation gets a mass. The sigma field is still massless so far. On the other hand, if we have magnetically charged particles in three plus one dimensions, then these are point-like sources of magnetic flux. They're exactly the monopole instantons that uh, Polyakov used to explain why three-dimensional three U1 gauge theory confines. Uh, they generate exactly this kind of, you know, a dilute gas of them generates this, this kind of cosine sigma potential, which says that the, the sigma field also gets a mass. But the important thing for our purposes here is what is the, how, does the, how do these masses, the masses of the components of the photon, the, basically the two polarizations of the photon, how do they depend on the radius? So, so you can see that as I take the radius to infinity, the mass of, the mass of both polarizations of the photon go to zero. Um, to understand this a little better, we could, we could have interpreted the circle that we just introduced as the thermal circle. So its radius is, is, the, is the inverse temperature. And uh, notice that the known forms of topological order in less than or equal to three plus one dimensions have the property that at any finite temperature, they're actually smoothly connected to, the, to a product state, to the trivial phase. They're, the topological order that we know about in three plus one dimensions or fewer is, is, is a zero temperature property. At any finite temperature, it, it goes away. And this argument is perfectly consistent with what we've just what we've just seen. The one if the one form symmetry is emergent, as soon as the, the, there's a circle in the space time, a mass is generated for the photon, or alternatively, the ground state degeneracy is lifted. In the discrete case, um, on the other hand, there is there is stable topological order defined temperature. It it uh, in the platonic sense, at least, the two form Torah code in four plus one dimensions. So that is basically two form gauge theory uh, in in four space dimensions. Uh, is uh, exhibits a phase which which has topological order at uh, even at even at finite temperature below some critical temperature, and one way to think about that from this language is that a theory with a two form symmetry that theory has a two form symmetry. If you put it on a circle like the thermal circle, it still has a one form symmetry, and that one form symmetry can protect the degeneracy. So this this uh, transition at which this this uh, topological order is destroyed is an extremely interesting one. Which, which arises by the prol proliferation of strings. Um, it's uh, something we should understand better. Okay, so I, I, I mentioned this appeal to locality. So I said we can't add non-local operators to the action. And I, the reason that this argument isn't entirely satisfying, I know maybe some of you find it satisfying. I think maybe if, if one lived their lives entirely in the continuum, they might like this argument. But uh, if you've ever thought about any kind of lattice theory, such as a lattice gauge theory, could I interrupt? Yes, please. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, just to make sure that I got the argument right, could you go over again? Why? So you started by saying if you have an emergent symmetry, then it will be explicitly broken by a relevant operator. Then if you spontaneously break it, the goldstones will be uh, will have a small mass. That's so that's for zero form symmetries. Yes. Yes. Could yes. could you just say again, like in a couple of sentences, why that's different for higher form symmetries? Yeah, so that right, exactly. So that's that's the um, uh, that's the point I'm trying to make. So it's I'm saying that unlike in the zero form case where the goldstone gets a mass, uh, in the zero in the one form case, uh, it, it's the the goldstone is still exactly massless, massless even when the, even when the symmetry is emergent. And I'm not sure what the best explanation for this is. So um, uh, I think probably this 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 argument number two is morally morally correct. Sorry. Um, the, the 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 idea being that in order to uh, explicitly break such a symmetry, you need to add non-local operators to the action, 
and you can't, you, well, in, in a continuum limit of a, of a local field theory, there aren't any non-local operators in the action. So, but let me, let me ex explain that a little bit more. That's what I was about to do. So that's, I think this is the, maybe the most concise uh, summary of the difference, right? So in the, in the zero form case, the charge operators are local operators. You can add them to the action with impunity. In the, in the one form case, the charge operators are, are loop operators. It's, let's just say it's difficult to add them to the action. Um, and so Great, let me explain, well, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, let me explain a little more what I mean by it's difficult to add them to the action. So on the lattice, we, we add loop operators to the action all the time. For example, the, you know, the Wilson action for lattice gauge theory is the sum over small loops of products you know, with these loop operators. And the real question of whether the symmetry uh, is, um, of what happens to the symmetry is uh, as we coarse grain this lattice theory, do these, do these loops become larger or smaller? Do they become point-like loops in the continuum, point-like in the continuum, or do they, um, do they grow as we coarse grain? And one way to think about this is, let's think about the case of a zero-form symmetry. Um, so start with, say, a CFT just for definiteness and perturb it by some charged operator of some definite dimension. Then one way to diagnose what happens in the infrared is to compute the, the partition function of the perturbed theory in perturbation theory in this coupling. And in a CFT, we know how this behaves. It's some power law. We can do the integrals. And we, see, we encounter this, this uh, expected dichotomy. If the operator is relevant, there's an infrared divergence. The L is the size of the system. If the operator is irrelevant, there's an ultraviolet divergence. So that is a relevant operator changes the infrared behavior. So we can try to imitate this argument in the case of this frightening thing where we perturb the action by uh, a sum of loop operators. Again, we can try to see how the partition function is perturbed. And, and so you see it's governed by this sum over loops of the expectation value of the loops. So to define that, let me make some assumptions. So the first assumption is I'm gonna regulate that sum with, with a, say a cubic lattice. I'm gonna assume that we're in the broken phase where there's a strict, oh, sorry, I meant strict perimeter law here. That's, that, that word is wrong, strict perimeter law. This goes like the length of the loop. And I'm gonna approximate the loops as independent. So I could do the sum. And the result of that, of this sum over all loops on the independent loops on the lattice, can be written as this integral. Um, I won't explain exactly how to do that. It's not too bad. Um, it's in Carter's book, for example. Um, and you see this, this quantity has, has some familiar interesting features. So notice there's a critical value of t. t is this uh, coefficient of the perimeter law. Um, below which the sum over loops gives a finite answer. Basically, the argument of log is less than, is less than one. Uh, yep. Yeah. And uh, near this critical point, we can expand this thing, and it looks like this. So surely this is, everybody recognizes this as the, uh, the world line partition function of a, of a, single, a single particle of mass m. And uh, so this is, and you, you see in, in this partition function here, we're, we're basically exponentiating this quantity. So this is just a gas, a, a, you know, a sum over a dilute gas of these charged particles. It's just the world line description of coupling the gauge field to a Higgs particle. And so, we under, so now we understand uh, the dichotomy about whether the loops get larger or smaller in the sense that, uh, well, this charged particle can condense. If it condenses, then it Higgs is the gauge field, the photon is massive. And uh, if it doesn't condense, then it doesn't it doesn't affect the, the mass of the photon. So I think this is, how to say, uh, a step towards a better understanding of this distinction between zero form, emergence of zero form symmetries and emergence of one form symmetries. Okay, so this having, having uh, maybe understood a little bit about this, uh, we, were, we were slightly emboldened and, uh, and tried to answer the following question. So, uh, a uh, theoretical apparatus that follows directly from, from this point of view on, on symmetries is mean field theory. Um, it, it, it says, well, we'll find an order parameter for the symmetry that you're going to break and write a field theory for it. And so a natural question to ask is, what is the analog of that for one form symmetries? And uh, being brave, uh, Nabil and I decided to call this mean string field theory. Um, and so here, you'll see why in, in, in a moment. So recall the ordinary case of, a, say, a U, U1 zero form sy symmetry. Uh, there's some order parameter that transforms linearly under, under, under that symmetry. 
and demanding locality in space and a derivative expansion of this, uh, of this mean field, uh, the Landau, Ginsburg, and Wilson tell us that we should write an action like this. It's an expansion in powers of phi and derivatives of phi, and it's, and it's local in space. And one way to think about where this comes from is that it's a, it comes from a variational ansatz for the ground state as a product state. And this, this phi specifies the, the local state of each of the degree of freedom at each point. John, can I interrupt for a second? Uh, you're Please. not traveling in a different direction. I, I still have a question regarding the previous part, right? Okay. Uh, so whether you have fine attempt to order or not, that is usually uh, the usual deal with Merman Wagner, what is it, Coleman whatsoever, uh, did the same thing, right? And there, in the modern way of doing it, is the first thing you do is try to identify the topological excitation associated with a particular order parameter and decide whether that, that thing is point-like or not at finite energy, at finite temperature, excuse me. And it's point-like, you will destroy the order at all finite temperatures. Can you discern something of that kind in your one-form symmetry business that takes the role of the uh, uh, disorder operator, of the topological operator, like the vortex for you one? That, that's exactly right. So, the, so the, the fact that it's a one-form symmetry that's being broken means that the defect, the, yeah. the excitation that carries the charge under the one-form symmetry is, is, a loop, is, is a loop operator in space-time. So that means it's a particle. It's a particle and, at finite yeah. temperature. So that means that at finite temperature, it can wind around the formal circle and yeah. exactly, this, yeah. exactly this, this kind of argument that yeah. I described. It's like a particle in what is 3D or something in three space dimensions. Uh, th th that's right. That's right. It's it's in, th in this example, it's the it's the monopole in yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, and in, indeed, the distinction with the two form Torah code and four plus one dimensions is that the, the defects are strings in that case rather than particles. Yeah. Good. Okay. So back to mean string field theory. So okay. So I hope I hope this paragraph is is uncontroversial. Um, here comes the the brave part. <laughs> um, so let's suppose we have an order parameter for, for a U11 form symmetry breaking. That is, it's a, it's, it's a string field, right? It's a field that's supported on curves and it transforms onto the one form symmetry like this by a phase that comes from integrating, you know, this, this lambda is the, is the parameter, the analog of alpha. You have to integrate it over the curve in question. And if, um, well, okay, let's, let's, the thing we're going to try is demanding locality, not in ordinary space, but in loop space. And we're going to demand that there's a derivative expansion in terms of a certain area derivative introduced by, by Migdal, essentially. Um, and so again, while well, imitating the form of this action, there's a term that's something like a potential v of, v of absolute value of psi. So that's, you see absolute value of psi is invariant under this transformation. And then there's something like a kinetic term which comes from this area derivative, which add, you know, it adds a little, a, little, a little bit to the loop in the mu nu plane. And we can assume that this potential again has this kind of expansion. And uh, I wanna think about this again as a variational statement that the ground state, we're making an ansatz for the ground state as a sum over loops. And this psi of c has something to do with the wave function of those loops, the amplitude with which those loops participate in the ground state. And so, a, a, I think an achievable goal uh, for, for this framework is to develop a sort of crude picture of the phase diagram and transitions between the phases, um, just, as one, just as one does in ordinary zero form in field theory, for, but now for systems with one form symmetries. And so, so far, uh, so what can we do? Well, here's the, here's the equations of motion. Given an action, you should certainly try to find the equations of motion. Um, and uh, we can identify two, two, two kinds of phases depending on, sorry, depending on the sign of this parameter r, r is the, 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 the coefficient of the quadratic term and the potential. If r is positive, then well, basically the, the, the wave function wants to be zero. Um, a slightly more, a slightly better ansatz is, is uh, something like this. Say that the, uh, the wave function is, is e to the minus beta area, where area, by area of c, I mean the minimal, the, the area of the minimal surface whose boundary is C. If there's no surface whose boundary is C, if C is non-contractible, then it's just zero. And uh, plugging this into the equations of motion, we learn that beta is related to R. Uh, so in the limit of large R, this approximation is actually, uh, this, 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 this 
this uh, Ansatz solves the equations and it gives an area law. So that's the unbroken phase. Um, if we, uh, sorry, I should have here, I should have said if we set R, if we make R negative, the strings want to condense a state where the, where the wave function is an approximately uniform superposition of loops is called a string, string condensed phase by Levin and Wen. Um, and it's, it's a description of the deconfined phase. Um, and so to understand this phase, let's, um, how to say, we know that the answer is going to be something like a perimeter law. So let's parameterize this string field in terms of things supported on, on the perimeter of the loop. There can be a line tension term, which will give the literal perimeter law. There can be a geometric term, a thing which, which well, it's going to be the gauge field. And then there can be all kinds of higher things involving more derivatives on the world line, which will, which will turn out to give massive fields. Um, if we assume that the world line tension has an expectation value, we can plug this back into the action. Um, and uh, <laughs> there's an extremum with, uh, in the limit where mu is large, where their loops are small. And this reproduces the Maxwell action for this gauge field with a tension that's determined, sorry, with a Maxwell coefficient that's determined by, by this uh, term in the, in the string field potential. And a small check uh, that this logic is making some sense is that if, is that if we redo it for, for Zn, one form symmetry, it gives back the BF theory of, of Zn gauge theory that I wrote earlier. So um, this is, you know, how to say, uh, there's a lot of things to worry about in this description. In particular, this, this integral over curves in the action is really pretty terrifying to me still. Um, and, uh, uh, but I think, I think it's, a, it's at least a promising framework from which I think we can learn, learn a bit more. In particular, we might hope to understand something about what its description of the critical point is. And, uh, uh, perhaps something about the upper critical dimension. Okay, so um, this brings me to the second part of the Landau paradigm, which is, which is that the idea that not only should we understand the phases in terms of symmetries, but we should also understand what are the critical degrees of freedom at, at the transitions between, between the phases. So in particular, in a transition from an ordered phase to a disordered phase, the critical degrees of freedom should be the fluctuations of the order parameter, naturally. And again, there are some apparent exceptions to this. Uh, perhaps the, not the most obvious are direct transitions between states that break different symmetries, uh, which are called deconfined quantum critical points. Um, and more, perhaps more obviously, are transitions out of deconfined phase, excuse me, where there's no, no local order parameter. So for example, this phase we've been talking about, the deconfined phase of, of Z2 gauge theory, um, say in two plus one dimensions. Um, here there's, you know, there's the order parameter. Well, okay, there's no local order parameter. And uh, in fact, uh, both of these examples can be understood in terms of symmetries. I won't say, I won't, I don't want to say too much about deconfined phase transitions, but um, the case that I want to think about is this transition out of um, the, the deconfined phase of Z2 gauge theory. This second part of the Landau paradigm says that we should be able to understand the, the critical theory in terms of fluctuations of the string order parameter. So in this mean string field theory, we were, we were literally trying to build a theory of that order parameter. Um, but um, you know, by by Wegener's duality between the between in three dimensional between the three D three D Ising gauge theory and the Ising model, um, this theory is the same as the three D Ising model. That is, the local data of this transition, the critical exponents, are the same as in the three D Ising model. And so this logic suggests that. Uh, near the critical point of the 3D Eisen model, there should be some description as a string theory, as a theory, as a theory of loops. And so um, uh, let me say a little bit more about that. How are we doing on time? Okay, good, yeah. Um, so this is what, this is what we'll, spend, we'll spend the rest of the, rest of the time talking about. This idea that the 3D Eisen model is a string theory is an old one. There's a, a lot of literature on it, which but for some reason or other seems to end around 1994. Um, and there's some reason to hope that we can, that it can be understood better. Um, so, well, we're going to be trying to be open-minded. Um, that's, I guess that's, <laughs> that's, that's the first reason. Um, and the second, the second perhaps better reason is that we've learned a lot about non-perturbative string theory since 1994, and maybe some of it we can, we can use. So let me, let, let's retreat a little bit to two dimensions. And think about the right way to understand the 2D Ising model. So here's a picture of the 2D Ising model on the triangular lattice. So the red dots are, are spin up, 
empty space, empty honeycombs are spin down on the triangle, the triangle that is dual to this honeycomb. And uh, the picture suggests that you should organize the sum as a sum over uh, configurations of these blue uh, edges that separate uh, up spins from down spins. So that is, we can rewrite the partition sum of the Ising model on the triangular lattice as, a, as twice the sum over loops on the honeycomb lattice, and sum over closed loops on the honeycomb lattice. And the reason that there's a two is that if I reverse all of the ups and downs, it doesn't change the configuration of the loops. Um, a small uh, technical issue, which will be instructive, is if we did this instead on the square lattice, there's an annoying thing that can happen which is I can have a, a configuration where up and down spins are, are organized in this way around a single vertex. And this configuration is, how to interpret this configuration in terms of loops is ambiguous. I could either interpret it as two loops that are crossing, or I can interpret it as um, two loops that are meeting like this, or two loops that are meeting like this. And a useful resolution of this confusion is actually just a sum over all of these configurations, but with a sign, which is the number of self-intersections of the loops, which has the consequence that two of these three cancel each other, leaving behind just a single one. So on the square lattice, the, the, the analog of this formula actually involves a minus one to the number of self-intersections of the loops. And this is the first hint that these loops are world lines of fermions. Um, so you recognize that if you exponentiate that uh, into a sum of connected loops, this is the world line sum for a real fermion in, uh, in, two, in, in two dimensions. Um, Okay, so, okay, never mind about that. It's fermion, the world lines are fermions. And in fact, we can, in this case, we can be very explicit about making the fermion operators. Um, they're a combination of the disorder operator, the object which, which uh, uh, flips, the, flips the signs of the couplings along the links, along a whole curve here. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a disorder operator in the, in the sense that it destroys the order. Um, and uh, this operator is independent of the choice of this curve because of the Z2 symmetry. And the familiar duality interchanges uh, the spin, spin operator and this disorder operator. And the object which is self-dual under that interchange is, is, is the thing that's a fermion. Because when I, when I uh, move this thing in a loop, it the spin here necessarily crosses the branch cut. It gets a minus sign. And it's not too hard to show in the lattice that this thing satisfies a lattice version of the Dirac equation. It becomes the Dirac equation here's the critical point. Okay, so let's try to do the analog of that for the 3D Ising model. In the 3D Ising model, here's the analog of that picture. The red dots are upspins. These walls are the boundaries of the regions of upspins. Um, again, we can define an analog, a disorder operator. Now it's defined, it, it's associated with a curve. That is, we pick every, every plaquette that's inside, that's that's uh, you know, on a surface bounded by that curve and flip the sign of the interaction. It's independent of local changes in the surface, again, by the spin symmetry. Um, you should think of the surface as a branch cut for the spins. And again, we can define an object, which is a combination of the disorder operator and the spins, which satisfies something like a Dirac equation, except it's a Dirac equation for each, for each link on this curve, um, which, uh, is reminiscent of the equations of motion for a remote number short superstring, the sort of physical state condition. Um, and so for this reason, Polyka suggested that um, the 3D Ising model is related to some kind of RNS superstring. Um, there's, a, there's some issues with this idea. Uh, one of them was pointed out by Dissler. Um, he argued that the analog of the self-intersection number in the, in the 2D case is the Euler character of the surfaces. So that is, he, he claimed that you could rewrite the 3D Ising model partition function as a sum over surfaces weighted by minus one to the Euler character. And just as in two dimensions, this is an issue that you can, you can avoid by working on a lattice where each edge touches only three faces rather than four. Um, but the, the reason I mention this is that it emphasizes the fact that in this string theory, rather than being weighted by some small coupling, high genus contributions uh, have the same weight. That is, the, the absolute value of the string coupling is equal to one. Um, so, so maybe that's that's a how to say that's a challenge. Let's say. Um, and so, a question that we ask ourselves is whether we could modify the Ising model in such a way that the dual string theory would be weakly coupled. So that is, we want to we want to decrease the weight of the domain walls 
which have higher genus in the sum. So here's an example of a, a spherical domain wall. We want that one to be most important. Here's an example of a, a toroidal domain wall. Um, we want that one to be suppressed by a factor of g-string squared. And um, so this is what we're going to try to do. And there are basically two possible outcomes of doing this, assuming that the modified model still has a continuous transition, which it will. Uh, one possibility is that is that making the string coupling smaller leads to a new universality class, a new kind of criticalizing model where spherical domain walls are more important. And then the other possibility is that it changes, it changes the critical temperature, but preserves the universality class. I'll let you think about which one you think is more likely. Um, and so here we go. Let's, let's try to modify the Eisen model. So here's how not to do it. I'm not going to say anything about that. Being, being string theorists, we thought maybe it should involve matrices. That turned out to be too overly complicated. In fact, there's a very simpler thing that we could do, which is just change the weights of the domain walls depending on their topology. So that is, we're just going to modify the Boltzmann weights. Um, so W0 is the ordinary Ising Boltzmann weight. And chi here um, is a perfectly local functional of the spin configuration, which is just the number of faces minus the number of edges plus the number of vertices uh, in the dual lattice that participate in, in, in domain walls. Uh, in, in the given configuration S. So this is a local Hamiltonian. This, this chi is a, a local term we can add to the Hamiltonian and see what happens. So this, okay, this statement requires a little bit of refinement, which will take us on a little adventure for the next few slides. Um, so I said, you just count, you know, count for each vertex face and, and, and edge of the domain wall to count how many domain walls it participates in. So yeah, just count of the dual lattice, count how many domain walls it participates in. But now consider this configuration. So here, this vertex part clearly participates in two domain walls, right? It's part of this domain wall and part of this domain wall. I, th I don't think anybody could argue with that. But what about this configuration? So this is an allowed configuration of spins, but it has two possible de more than two possible decompositions into a configuration of domain walls. And the annoying thing is that this one involves two, and this one involves three. So there's an ambiguity. Um, one, one way to avoid this ambiguity, which I'll call the no touching method is to add an energetic penalty in the Boltzmann weights to exclude the configurations that are ambiguous, doing the analogous thing to the 2D Ising model that is basically forbidding configurations, like local configurations like that. Um, you can see it doesn't change the critical behavior. It moves the, criti it moves the critical temperature. But this has the annoying property that you have to throw away a lot of configurations. So in doing Monte Carlo, it's, it's, it's rather unhealthy. An alternative possibility which is a little healthier, is to decide on a decomposition into elementary constituents. So there's two to the eight possible couplings of the, of the possible configurations of the spins, eight spins around a vertex of the dual lattice. So think of that as a, as a binary vector. Uh, I guess that should be z2 to the, to the eighth. Oh, wait, hold on. Sorry, these are configurations of the plaquettes around, there are 12 plaquettes touching a single a single vertex. This leads to a configuration of the plaquettes. And let's order them by the number of faces that are occupied. So the number of these, these p's that are non-zero and choose the bases with lowest weight. So for example, this, this one that I drew here decomposes into these two. This one that I drew here decomposes in these two because these are the lowest weight configurations. So that, and that can be done and it can be done in a way that's, that actually preserves all the lattice symmetries. There's only one more problem which is that not all resolutions of neighboring vertices are mutually compatible. So for example, uh, this configuration here um, uh, was, was, which is sort of manifestly two spheres touching each other, was assigned chi equals five by our algorithm. And the reason that that happened is that there is a disagreement across this vertex, across a vertex about, about what the configuration is. So there's actually a branch point in the middle of this vertex. Um, uh, which, which contributes to the Euler character. So the, the, the thing we need to do is for each vertex, record how the faces are connected to each other. And then for each edge, check whether the, the, the neighboring faces are, are compatible. And if not, there's a branch point which contributes minus one to the Euler character. Um, and uh, notice that this prescription actually allows unoriented, unoriented surfaces. There can be surfaces that have, that have an odd number of triple points uh, such as, such as this one, uh, which, you know, which make the Euler character odd. Um, and if you don't believe me that, that this sort of uh, uh, disagreement between faces leads to a, a 
contribution to a, a four pi branch point, which has other character minus one, uh, our, an appendix to our paper contains a kit with which you can assemble your own four pi branch point by, by, uh, by cutting and gluing. And you can see that, that uh, such a thing is really, is indeed a throat like this, which contributes one to the other character. Okay, so, um, so we've defined this model, or actually we defined two models. We defined the no touching model where we just exclude the, the configurations where the domain will touch and the branch point model where, where we use this fancy, fancy rule involving branch points. Um, and so what does it do? The, the first thing we should do is some kind of mean field theory where we just look at the energy. So phi here is the log of the string coupling. Um, and depending on the sign of beta and phi, we want to either minimize or maximize the area and the Euler character respectively. And so this is, this is something we can do, for example, by assuming some, some not too big unit cell, uh, assuming that, that spatial symmetry isn't too badly broken. Um, we, can, we can identify which configurations have the, most, have the optimal, uh, optimal area and Euler character. And, uh, and we can identify order parameters that distinguish, distinguish them from each other. So, so for example, in the case of, of the branch point um, rules, uh, large, large beta um, and basically whatever you want to do with phi says that you want to maximize, you want to minimize the area. Uh, large negative beta means you want to maximize the area. Those are ferromagnet and anti-ferromagnet respectively. Large phi uh, means that you want to minimize the Euler character. That means you want a large negative Euler character, which is this so-called plumber's nightmare configuration. Um, <clears throat> large negative phi means you want to maximize the other character, which means you want everything to be spheres, which is realized by this so-called packed phase where everything is a bunch of spheres. Different colors correspond to different, um, different components of the domain rule. So every, each one of these is, is, is an independent sphere. So, uh, okay, with those expectations, we can try to try to simulate this model and see what happens. And one, basically a reason that we're able to simulate it is because um, despite, you know, we want to simulate near the critical point, uh, where, where critical slowing down is, is a dangerous thing um, is, because, is because we can generalize non-local updates, cluster updates to, uh, um, to, the, to, to this modified model. Because the modification depends only on the structure of the domain walls, um, it's not too hard to generalize cluster updates. Um, so that, that, that allows us to get around critical slowing down a bit. And so here are some simulation results on the left is results for the branch point rules. On the right is some results for the um, no touching rules. And in each case, I'm plotting the Binder cumulant, which is a you know a scale free quantity, which which um, uh, for different system sizes collapses if you if you know the critical exponents. If there's a if there's a continuous transition and you know the critical exponents, and you can see that, that these different system sizes lie nicely on top of each other in every case, which is an indication of uh, presence of a continuous transition. In each case, the critical exponent is the same as the 3 deizing one. So, the, so, the, so we see that the, the universality class hasn't changed, the critical temperature changes. Um, and uh, the reason that this happens, the reason that we knew this had to be the answer, is that the perturbation we're making of the Ising model is a sum of symmetric, that is Z2 symmetric, local scaling operators. We can, ex we can in the infrared, we can expand the perturbation in local operators of the Ising fixed point. But the Ising fixed point has only one symmetric relevant local operator, which is the energy operator, which is the one that you tune to go through the transition. And so since there's no other relevant operator, there's, there's really nothing else that can happen. All it can do is move the critical point. And so here's a, so the, the, the really interesting thing is what is the structure of the phase diagram? And here, here's a picture of the phase diagram, uh, which is color coded. Red is the amount of ferromagnetic order parameter. Green is the amount of anti-ferromagnetism. And blue is some combination of order parameters to, to, real, to, to indicate the packed phase. And so you can, so here's the disordered region. And you can see that the critical temperature of the, of the ferromagnetism uh, var varies with the string coupling. Um, and we indeed realize the packed phase here and the plumber's nightmare phase here as we expect from mean field theory. Um, okay, so, so now a question that, that, that I'm sure is burning in all of your minds is, well, the reason we tried to do this is because we wanted to make the bare coupling, uh, we wanted to make the string coupling weak. How weak can we make the string coupling? So to diagnose that, let's set beta to zero. 
So that is, that is, uh, that, this is when the critical temperature goes to infinity and ask where, you know, at what value of G string does the transition occur? And so in this plot, you see, you can see that, well, the data collapse happens when, uh, well, when G string is 0.6, is, is two thirds. So this is, this, is, uh, this is the smallest we can make G string uh, while preserving the Ising universality class, at least with, in this, with this modification of the model. Um, so maybe I should emphasize a little bit about what we're trying to do here. So, you know, there, there's this G string, the coefficient of the Euler character is some, it's some term, it's some coupling constant in the, at the fixed point, at the Ising fixed point, it's just some, it has some fixed point value, um, which we can't control. And, and in fact, don't even know how to measure. The thing we're really trying to do is to make the dual string theory to the extent that it exists weakly coupled on the way to the fixed point. Um, at the fixed point, we can't control it. Okay, so having done all this work, we felt in, emboldened to make some speculations about what the world sheet theory might be. So maybe you'll indulge me for a few minutes in thinking, in thinking about that. So uh, a question that I haven't, haven't really addressed in this discussion of the putative string theory dual of the Ising model is how does the string, how does the Ising Z2 symmetry act in the string theory? The only thing I said about it is that the string world sheet is a branch cut for the spin. So that is across the string world sheet, one acts for the Z2 symmetry. A second hint is that the 2 plus 1D Ising gauge theory, which is obtained by gauging the Z2 symmetry, has fermionic excitations. So the fermionic excitation is the bound state of, of the E particle and the M particle, the end of the string, and, uh, and the flu magnetic flux particle. That's a, it's a fermion. And uh, uh, well, if we look at the spectrum of, of an RNS superstring, you know, it has it, the, of closed RNS superstrings, there's a remote remote sector and a never short, never, never short sector, which are bosonic. And the fermionic sectors come from our RNS or NSR sectors. And uh, this, uh, we expect this world sheet theory to be unoriented because the strings are valued mod two. And so in an unoriented closed RNS superstring, that this is the structure of the sectors. And in particular, this NSR sector is the one where there's a fermion. And so let's, let's try to identify that with the dion of, of the Ising Z2 gauge theory. Um, and the relationship between the Ising Z2 gauge theory and the ordinary Ising model is re they're related by gauging. Um, so if we gauge the fermion number symmetry to get rid of the fermions in this theory, then you know, we get rid of the fermions. And the consequence is that we, we end up with two Ramon Ramon sectors. Um, and there's a symmetry operator, a Carelli operator, which distinguishes these two remote remote sectors from each other. Um, and the conjecture is that that chirality operator is the Ising Z2, and uh, one of these sectors is the, uh, carries the spin. Um, so, okay. Um, having said that, it's, it's, tempting, it's tempting to try to interpret, in light of the developments in string theory of the last 20 years, interpret this, this conjecture as a holographic duality. Namely, that um, uh, the strings in question should live not in the same space necessarily, but in a space with an extra dimension. And at the fixed point where there's conformal invariance, there should, the space should be something like ADS4. Um, there are some immediate problems with this possibility. The first is that the bosonic nonlinear sigma model, whose target space is ADS4, is not a CFT, at least not at large radius. Um, uh, maybe. Uh, some of the remote remote fluxes on the previous slide uh, can explain uh, what, what holds the space up. Um, a second problem is that adding just a single extra dimension, just an extra radial direction, doesn't solve the problem of making your critical string theory. The sort of obvious solution of having a space like linear delton in the radial direction uh, has the problem that it violates the, the conformal symmetry. There's a tension between having a field depend on this radial direction and preserving the, the conformal symmetry of endo to sitter space. Um, there are some possible resolutions of this. Uh, perhaps the most promising is this notion of a composite linear deleton, where the, the operator that absorbs the, the vial anomaly on the world sheet is not just a single field, but rather some composite operator that, that nevertheless shifts under a world sheet scale transformation, namely something like the ADS kinetic term which is invariant under the target space scale transformations and roughly has the form of the operator that we, we described earlier. Um, 
Now, the only problem with this is that it requires me to define log of the derivative of the world sheet field. And what the heck does that mean? Well, the context where that means something is if we expand around a large flat domain wall that is a, a, a long string. Uh, so we can ask about the string theory that governs the fluctuations of such an object. And, and if large and flat means that, that it's mostly proportional to sigma, it's stretched in, the, in, the, in this direction of the world sheet. And so dx is non-zero and log of dx squared makes, you know, means something. And this perspective actually has been applied in the past uh, in the Ising gauge theory, for example, in this paper where they, they uh, uh, the fluctuations of such a string uh, away from the critical point, make a prediction for the behavior of this ratio of Wilson loops, which actually, which actually is, is confirmed pretty dramatically by their simulations. Uh, relatedly, my colleague Julius Cudi did some studies of, of the spectrum of a domain wall in the 3D Ising model. Uh, again, again, in the ordered phase, but below the critical temperature, and found a gapped breathing mode on the world sheet. It's something, there's a domain wall, and the thickness of the domain wall is something that can oscillate. And uh, this point of view that, uh, uh, well, well, I claim that, that closer to the critical point, uh, the theory where the, th the theory is becoming scale invariant, this mode should be gapless and should be the Goldstone mode for the breaking of the scale transformation by the profile of the wall, just as the, the, the coordinate fields X on the wall are Goldstones for breaking translations by the wall. And so this, this mode should be, the bulk, should be the bulk radial coordinate. So I claim that this mode that, that Julius found actually is some, some evidence that this is a holographic description, at least in this effective string theory of, of long domain walls. So, uh, let me let me let me wrap up. Um, so, this this uh, this proposed duality is uh, it's puzzling in several ways. So probably you know I, maybe I should emphasize we shouldn't be too dogmatic dogmatic about exactly which strings are related to the you know which which objects in the in the CFT in the, the spin system are related to the strings. Uh, there are various possibilities, and in particular, it may be that under coarse graining, uh, the the effective string is actually some kind of coarse grained object with you know uh, so-called wall full handles uh, with a you know with a genus dependent tension. Uh, and then there are other objects in the lattice model also that we could consider uh, as as candidates for the strings. Um, notice that this is a pretty weird object. It's an unoriented string theory that doesn't have an open string sector. There's no space filling D brains. Uh, such things actually exist to my surprise. They were they were written down recently by these folks. But there's a there's a puzzle, uh, I think a rather difficult puzzle, about uh, the, the, such a duality, which is um, string theory in flat space has a Hagedorn growth of sing, single string states at high energy. That's something we know pretty well. Um, this works out in ADS CFT because um, in a large N gauge theory, there are many many words made of made of these adjoints that we you know that we can make. Uh, this matches the Hagedorn growth, but our weak coupling limit here didn't involve any large n, and so the the basically the only way out is that is if large curvature of the target space removes the Hagedorn spectrum of the string theory. Okay, so let me close just by advertising a mystery that we found. So this is you know in some sense just a byproduct of this uh, of this study. Uh, it's a mystery about the ordinary 3D Ising model, um, which is which is the following. So we measured you know, as part of what we what we did, we had to keep track of the Euler character, of course, of, of the domain walls. And so one thing we did was we measured the average Euler character per cluster. So keeping track of which clusters were, were connected to each other. Um, and uh, it has the property that at zero temperature, it goes to two, everything is spheres. At infinite temperature, it goes to minus infinity, everything is a big mess. Um, and so this this thing is a, it's a non-local observable, but it's, but it's computable. Whoa, hello. Um, Let's try that again. Okay, uh, and this is this is what we find. So this is for the branch point theory. This is for the no touching theory. They're basically all the same. The thing I want to point out is so the crossing of these curves is the critical point, uh, and this red line in each of these pictures is zero. So you'll notice that the place where these curve the the place where these curves cross zero is the critical point. So for some reason, the um, the value of the Euler character at the critical point, the average Euler character per cluster seems to be very close to zero. Um, 
And uh, at least in the ordered phase, the, the fluctuations are pretty small. Um, and so we, you know, we noted this observation in our paper and we got an email from David Hughes saying that people had noticed this kind of thing before um, in the 90s in a model like our no touching model and uh, had looked, looked more closely uh, at you know, sort of high resolu higher resolution simulations. And actually the thing they were studying was, was chi itself and not chi per cluster. And they found that it didn't cross. So this this couldn't have this couldn't have uh, had a crossing because there isn't such a local scaling variable with small dimension. Um, but we had still had some hope that chi per cluster uh, would have a crossing. And so we did a, a more careful study. And starting from one of these pictures I showed before, we zoomed in a bit near the critical point. We zoomed in a bit more, and we zoomed in a bit more, and it looks like it actually doesn't cross right at zero. Um, so uh, this is a bit of a mystery. And so what, so the next thing we did, so, you know, so the question that it seems to raise is, is the 3D Ising CFT made of donuts, right? Is it all genus zero surfaces? And so the next thing we did was study, make a histogram of the fraction of clusters, the number, the, the number of clusters with a given chi uh, on, on average. And uh, it turns out that at the critical point, that distribution looks like this. So here is two, this is spheres. There's a gigantic spike here at chi equals two. And then there's a peak at some large negative chi that depends on the system size. And in between, there's nothing. So actually there aren't that many tori in this picture. Um, and maybe, you know what, I, I can't resist showing this movie. We made a movie, wait, where did it go? There we go, here's the movie. Um, so this is, this is a history as I, oops, as I vary the coupling from, uh, as I vary the temperature from the disordered phase past the critical point into the ordered phase. So there's a big spike at the spheres that's not shown because it's too big to show. And as you reach, as you cross the critical point, that spike and the one, uh, and the one that's moving in from large negative chi from high genus surfaces merge. So it's not that there's a, that there are lots of tori. It's that uh, something more interesting is happening, and we don't understand what it is. It's this is purely a property of the ordinary Ising model, nothing to do with this modification we made. Um, and I would really like to know whether whether there's some universal fact um, that that distribution is exhibiting. It happens it happens for both of our microscopic regulators of the theory, um, and uh, I'd very much like to understand it better than I do. Okay, so final comment is Landau was more right than we thought. And this seems to be a good idea to, to take him seriously in, in a context where we have the opportunity, we seem to be learning something, still learning more from it. So th thanks for listening, sorry for going over time. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Um, do we have questions? It's a silent, I, I, I have an, uh, have more of a suggestion. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's something that kept us busy for a while, and uh, I've been complete failure. And that's uh, the, the brother of the uh, 3D icing, right? So you basically say, okay, 3D icing, uh, we, 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 we have this vacuum developed, right? And uh, we can discuss those domain walls, right? And then we try to write down a series of these domain walls explicitly. Right, and it was all very interesting, but when you go to four dimensional X, Y, so U1, global U1, you have actually a very similar situation, right? So the vortices are strings, and they can insist that duality should be universal, right? So the disordered phase should be a condensate of these vortices in the same sense that it's an icing. I guess one, one important difference there is that there the strings are oriented. I mean, it's a, it's a detail, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah I there are more differences, right? So uh, difference is, of course, the fact that the embedding dimension is now four. So you have to think a bit different uh, about how you build your uh, uh, vortex configurations. And very importantly, um, the ordered phase is compressible, right? So in icing, you go from incompressible to incompressible in XY. Uh, you are uh, dealing with an uh, Goldstone boson in the ordered phase. I don't know how to to address that in a, in, in a dual stringy language. And last but not least, the critical point 
is at the upper kilt dimension, right? So, so it's eventually a free fixed point, and now you have to figure out how your uh, effective strength description can actually uh, get to a free fixed point. Mm -hmm. So I think it's sort of a natural continuation. I think it's said, I think, please, this is the next one uh, to have a look at, because it's really sort of super susceptible to the same technology that you're developing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I definitely agree with the spirit of your remarks. I can even uh, send you a reference to uh, the paper where we admitted our failure. That may give you some insight. Uh, admittedly, you know, uh, somehow too primitive. We didn't get further than guesswork. Sure, great. Yeah, I'd love so to I see do that. definitely have something to, to look at. Great. Okay, thanks um, for the question. Uh, the next in line is Nat. It's on YouTube. Hi. Hi, John. Hi, Nat. Um, I was just wondering, uh, the, the modified model you wrote, is there any relation with like the double semion model? Because I noticed that for the double semion model, you can write the wave function as like um, where the loops are, are, are weighted by the Euler characteristic oh, uh, well, inside. It, the double semion model, is, I thought it was minus one to the number of loops. Is that right? So right, yes. right. So yeah, some there are yeah there are there are topological phases. I guess they're SPTs where the wave function involves a phase with minus one to the Euler character of, um, of the downspins and closing that loop. I guess yeah, yeah of um, the dual of the double semion. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the double double semion itself though I think is is a simpler invariant that's involved. It's just the it's just the number right right. Of, uh, of I was just wondering if it's if there's any relation with what you're considering here. Um, yeah, so I guess, right, so uh, I think a, a, a very interesting question is, so this, uh, this Distler observation about the sign of the string coupling uh, is pretty interesting. Um, so, you know, so he says that the string coupling has to be, has to be minus one or, or negative. Mm -hmm. And it, it turns out that, that that sign of the string coupling um, is related to, um, okay, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, in the in this in this paper I mentioned by Kaida uh, Martinez Para and uh, Tachikawa, they construct various kinds of unoriented strings, um, and the 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 thing that they're varying is they're attaching to the world sheet theory some one plus one dimensional symmetry projected topological phase, mm -hmm. and for there's you know there's some cl classification of such phases. And uh, uh, for different choices of, of elements of that classification, they get different string, string, string theories. And one of those choices, uh, which I think it's something like the, okay, I forget exactly which it is, but in the, in, in, in the unoriented theories is exactly whether the string coupling is plus or minus one, plus, plus or minus. Um, so I think, yeah, so rather than, I think that sign actually has an interpretation as a SPT on the world sheet rather than as a topological thing about the space time. Uh, may, okay, may, I'm not sure exactly what it means about the space time, but it definitely has that interpretation on the world sheet. Um, mm -hmm. This, uh, yeah, this choice of, of plus or minus sign of G string also appears in the recent work on, on uh, the tenfold way of JT gravity um, uh, by, by Stanford and Witten. Where so amongst the these ten symmetry classes of uh, matrix ensembles, um, the one of one of the choices involved in, in that classification is is whether the dual uh, dual theory has has positive or negative string coupling. It's the same kind of thing. Um, okay. Do do we have more questions? Or follow ups, comments. All right, if that's not the case, then um, first of all, thank you, John, again. Um, thanks to everyone who asked questions, kept this lively. And um, um, if John and maybe Nabil, you want to stick around for a little bit, um, sure. what we try to offer is to have something like a seminar hang out after the seminar um, here. So like that's the idea, anybody who wants to ask informally, um, 
I will stop the recording now. Um, and everybody is, of course, free to go or to stick around. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.